You bow your heads uh, with me as we pray that the Lord would bless us as we turn our attention to his word. Father God, we are so thankful to be in, in your house today and to be uh, here to worship you and to lift up your name. You are worthy. There is no one like you. And we, we know that and believe that. And that's why we gather together uh, in this place of worship to praise and, and, and worship you and to declare that you are indeed God, our God and the only true God. And we're so thankful that you have made yourself known to us and brought us into a relationship with you. And Lord, we're thankful that you are a God who makes your, your will and your mind known to us, that you do reveal yourself to us, Lord, through your word. And we praise you that as we turn our attention to the word of God to be read and preached, that we know that it is God breathed, that it comes to us in truth and in authority and power. Uh, that it is inspired and inerrant and infallible. And we believe these things. And so we rest and put confidence in the word of God to, to lead us and to guide us as, as individuals and families and as a church. And Lord, we acknowledge the importance of the preach word. And we pray today that as we, your, your uh, body of believers here on Northside Drive, as we together collectively hear your word and apply it to our lives, that you would shape us as a congregation and continue to make us, Lord, the, the people you would have us be. Uh, Lord, thank you for, for doing that for us and thank you for working in and through preaching. I stand before your people today as, uh, as your servant and I just ask that you would use me, that you would help me to have clarity of, of thought and expression and, and boldness in the gospel and that, um, Lord, we would leave here today uh, having been challenged in ways that we may need to be challenged and encouraged, Lord, in the ways that we need to be encouraged. And so we turn this time over to you and we trust you in it and we ask that you would work. And it's in the name of our Savior, our Lord Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, would you please open them with me to uh, the book of Revelation? And we are, have started a new uh, sermon series. Actually, we started it last week looking at these uh, seven messages from Jesus through uh, the Apostle John to these churches, to these seven churches spread through Asia Minor. And today uh, we're going to look at the second of these churches and these messages, which is to the church in Smyrna. And so if you would open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to pick up our reading at verse 8 and read down through verse 11. Revelation 2, verse 8 through verse 11. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The words of the first and the last who died and came to life, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. And this is, this is God's word. May he now bless it to us that we would understand it and apply it to, uh, to our lives. Now, as I mentioned before reading the passage, this is the, the second of these sermons from these churches in Revelation, and uh, this is the second city that that Jesus looks at and addresses through the Apostle John. And if you took the chance, and it's okay if you didn't, but to look at these churches in Asia Minor, if you looked at a map last week after the sermon, you'd see that they kind of circle around sort of like that. And John is out on this island. He's in exile. And he's receiving this revelation from Jesus. And so he's looking out and seeing the sea and all these things that are separating him from these churches that he has had some connection to. And Jesus gives him this revelation, and the revelation is all of revelation, but he, he has these specific messages to these individual churches, and this one's to the church in Smyrna. Now, the, the most important city in Asia Minor at that time was, was most likely Ephesus, and it was, a, it was a large city, significant city, uh, a city of great wealth and commerce and all those kind of things, but, but Smyrna was also, in some ways, it, it rivaled Ephesus in terms of its wealth, its significance. Uh, the, the ways that it was known throughout the Roman Empire, its importance to Caesar, its faithfulness to Caesar, uh, and all those kinds of things. But the thing that stands out about this particular city and the church that was in this city is that this was a, this was a hurting church. 
And it was a hurting church because it was being persecuted. And the persecution is rather severe. We'll talk about the details of that in just a moment. Now, it, it experienced the kind of persecution that I, I would probably say, and with some confidence, that, that most of us who are gathered here this morning have probably not experienced in either kind or degree. And so you'll, you'll hear some of the details of what they were dealing with as we move into the passage. But because we have not experienced the kind or degree of persecution that these, these believers were facing uh, in the ancient world, I think it is important for me to make sure that I connect some dots for you. So that as you listen to this, this sermon today, that you are able to take the things that I'm saying and apply them to to where you are right now. And I think there's some, some helpful ways for, for you and me to do that. Uh, one way is to just basically affirm a truth, and that is that, that this is, when it comes to persecution, we really are dealing with, with one of uh, a whole number of ways that we as believers in Christ suffer in this world. And so as we listen to Jesus speak to this church, and as we listen to Jesus bring encouragement to this church as they go through the things that they are going through, uh, that does speak to us, regardless of the kinds of suffering that we may have experienced. And, and, and to remind us of, of something that is true, that we all live in a, a broken and fallen world. Uh, and even though we may not in the moment experience the kinds of, of suffering these believers were experiencing, we do suffer and we do experience pain and trials and tribulation. And those are things that are true for us. And if if you're not experiencing them right now, praise God for it, you probably will. Because it's just, it's just life. Life is hard and life is difficult. And so as you hear these encouragements, they are to you today, regardless of whether you are right where these, these believers are. But, but with that, I think we can, we can say more. I think this is one of these passages that as we study it right now at this moment, that we study it as a part of preparation for us. And, and we study it with, within our minds a sense of, of recognition that we can at any time experience this exact same kind of persecution that these, these believers were experiencing in, in Smyrna. You know, we, we have been blessed as a nation, and, and you know that. I mean, we just celebrated the, the 4th of July, and that's, that's a celebration of our independence, and it's a, a celebration of, of of a recognition that we have in this nation experienced great freedom. And, and part of the freedom that we experience is a, is a religious freedom, that we, we have that, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful that I can stand up in front of you today and, and, and say the things that I'm going to say from the Word of God and, and, and not be fearful that somebody's going to walk in the door and arrest me and put me in prison. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that. But at the same time, one of the things that you, you probably know, if you do any, any reading on, on you know, what's going on in the Western world, is, is that you know, Christendom has come to its end, pretty much. And, and, and we live in a day and age where, where the, the church is, is being more and more marginalized. That would be, I, I think, one way of putting it. Uh, we live in a day and age where the church has less and less influence on the world that we live in. And, and less and less power on the world that we live in. And, and as our world continues to embrace particular kinds of values and things that are significant to the world outside of the church, it's important to the world, and they hold up these things, and these things are, are significant that they're, you know, that to, to the societies we live in. And as we take particular stance as churches that are different than that, right, as we continue to hold on to what the Bible teaches, then we can expect, I think, and, and I think the church should expect, we should be prepared for this, that because of that, we may experience different forms of rejection. And we may experience different ways in which we are marginalized more and more. We may experience particular ways of hardship that we would face if we stand for the truth. And nobody in this room should be surprised by that. Nobody in this room should be caught off guard if that happens to any of us, because it's, it's the nature of living in a world that we live in, that is broken and fallen and rebellious towards God. And so as our world takes on more of that and we hold on to the truth, we should expect that. And I think this passage prepares us. It's one of the ways that as we look at it, 
and we hear these things that these believers are dealing with, and we think about what Jesus is saying to them, he's speaking to us, and he's preparing us, and he's readying us. But then another way that I think is important for us to, to study this passage is to ask ourselves whether the reason why we are not experiencing rejection, if that's the case, you're never experiencing any rejection, is because we've fallen into a pattern of compromise. And I, I think it is impossible to read and study a passage like this without that challenge to come to us. Whether there have been times, and I'll tell you where this would happen with us, it may not be a, a state-sponsored persecution, but it may be what happens in, in times when we're with family members who don't know Jesus, or friends who don't know Jesus, or in work, or school, all those kind of settings where you hear particular things and you see particular things happening, and, and you're unwilling to speak up and you're unwilling to say something because if you, know, you know that if you open your mouth and if you speak, if you say something, then the possibility is you're going to be made fun of or laughed at or rejected or lose something as a result of taking a particular stand for Christ. That's a reality that we probably experience often. And I think it, it should challenge us. As we listen and think about this church, we need to be challenged. Now, with all of that sort of as a setup for us, as we then begin to kind of then dig in and start saying, okay, what does this say to us? What, what I think Jesus is doing here as he speaks to this church, the church in Smyrna, is he's calling them, and this, is, this will be an overarching message, and then I think he offers some, some ways in which we can do this. And the overarching message is he's calling them to persevere. Okay? That's what he wants from them. He wants them to, to persevere. And then what he does to get them to persevere is he gives them a, a, a biblical perspective on the things that are going on, and then he offers them a promise. Okay? So the call is to persevere. He offers them a perspective that, that he alone can give to them. And then he promises something to them that I think he alone promises to his people. Now, he, he wants, and this is the, the overarching message, it's, it's, it's persevere. It's, it's keep on. I mean, someone has, has made this statement that, that perseverance is the, is the hallmark of a genuine interest in Christ. And I think that is so true. That, that if, we, if we really are interested in the things of God, if, if, if Jesus really does matter to us, and he matters to us more than other things matter to us, which he should matter to us more than other things matter to us, then, then a sign of that is that regardless of what may be going on in our lives, and regardless of how hard and difficult and painful things may be, if we are genuinely interested in Jesus more than anything else, we're going to keep after Jesus. We're going to keep following him. We're going to have this genuine interest in him. Now, in this particular passage, one of the things Jesus does, and he does it in all of them, is he, he calls them, and you see this down at verse 11, he, he calls them to basically conquer. And, and this is a refrain that he uses in all of these letters. He tells all of them to conquer, basically. Now, we, we know what he means by conquer in any particular situation by what he's talking about. And so when he speaks to the church in Ephesus and he tells the church in Ephesus, you know, listen, you guys are holding on to doctrine, but you have abandoned your first love. And he tells them that they need to conquer. Well, in telling them to do that, what he's saying is conquering then means you need to repent and turn back to your first love. Okay? When he tells this particular church that they need to, they need to conquer, what he's calling them to is a life of faithfulness. What he's calling them to is, is to overcome, to, to persevere in the midst of all the things that are happening to them that they need to keep on keeping on, if you will. They need to continue on in this commitment to Christ. And if you, if you notice what he says in verse 10, what he does in verse 10 is he, I think he offers them, first of all, something that pr will prevent them and us, I think, from persevering, and then he calls them to this life, and he's explicit at this life of faithfulness. So he said at the beginning of verse 10, do not fear what you're about to suffer. 
And then he goes on towards the end of verse 10 to say, be faithful unto death. And so if you, if you take those two things and you put them together, here's, here's what we have to keep in our minds if we're going to persevere. One, don't be afraid and be faithful unto death. Don't be afraid and be faithful unto death. Now, in telling us don't be afraid, I think he is, I mean, if you just think about it for a moment, he's, he's dealing with one of the main things, and maybe others, but he is certainly dealing with one of the main things when it comes to rejection, when it comes to, to, to persecution, that keeps us from being faithful. It's we're afraid. We're afraid. Because we, we're afraid of what we could lose. We're afraid of what could happen. We're afraid that someone may not like us. We're afraid that somebody may think we're foolish or stupid or whatever, right? It doesn't take much for you to identify. In fact, as I say these words to us, I, I can imagine that every one of us here, if you just put your mind to it just for a minute, could think of a time when you retreated, when you shrunk, when you didn't talk, and you did it because you were just afraid. Okay. Now, as we, as we hear that and sort of receive that just from the things that we've experienced, I think we can certainly identify with with this potential for compromise and for giving up that was taking place in this church. Because if you just think about it, I mean, notice what Jesus says. Here's what's happening. L listen to me, verse 9. I know your tribulation and your poverty and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. I mean, you, you back up and go, well, we know who's ultimately behind all of this. I mean, later on in the passage, and we'll, we'll talk about that more when we get to it, he talks about how the devil's about to throw some of you in prison. The one who's ultimately behind all this is the evil one. He is, the, the, he is Satan, that means adversary. He is the enemy of God. And what he is attempting to do in this world is destroy all those things that are of God. And so he is behind this. But he is at work, and in this particular instance, through Jews that are in this city, in Smyrna, and probably, and we don't know for sure because Jesus doesn't tell us, but here's one of the things that, that did happen in the first century world at times. That, that you know, a lot of the believers who were coming to Christ were not only Gentiles, but a lot of them who were coming to Christ were, were Jews. And so they were... They were, they were leaving Judaism, trusting in Jesus, or finding the, let me say it another way, finding the completion, if you will, of their Judaism in Christ, who was the Jewish Messiah. There, there could very well have been some jealousy that was being stirred up in the synagogue and so forth because of, of what was happening with those who, who were Jewish, and now they're becoming followers of Jesus, the Messiah. And so a way that the Jewish synagogue could have responded to this is, basically told the Roman authorities, and this would have been the slander, told the Roman authorities that these Christians are not a part of Judaism. Now, I don't know if you know this, but in the, in the ancient world, the first century world, Judaism had an allowance where, you know, in, in the ancient world, everybody had to worship Caesar, they had to worship the emperor. But Judaism was given an allowance that they did not have to. They were monotheists, they could worship their own God. And, and a lot of what happened in early Christianity is it was so identified with Judaism that early Christianity actually got some freedoms there where they weren't immediately persecuted because they were considered to be Jews. But you could see how if, if there's a group of people who are now opposed to Christians and they go to the Roman authorities and they say, these aren't Jews, then all of a sudden... Now Christians are being forced to worship Caesar. And one of the ways that we persevere is we worship our God. We don't worship any government. 
any man besides the man Jesus, any power. And so the persecution could have come because they would not worship Caesar. And so this state-sponsored persecution from, from the Roman authorities upon these Christians would have looked something like this. You, you have no freedoms. You, have, you cannot keep your employment. You cannot have a home. And so when it talks about tribulation and, and poverty, this was a, a, a horrific form of impoverishment where they would not have been able to provide for themselves even or have homes or, or any of those kinds of things. And so you can imagine all the things that would have gone on in the midst of that. I mean, think, think in your own mind. Again, let me, let me bring some, some sense in which you can identify with this. If you're going through hardship, and it doesn't have to be persecution, you're just going through a, a really difficult thing in your life. And that difficult thing that's going on in your life, it continues, and it continues, and it gets worse. It doesn't seem to get any better. Well, where does your mind go? Pam, why, why am I doing this? Why am I continuing to, to honor a God who is allowing me to suffer like this? Does God still love me? You just think about the haze of confusion and doubt and questions that, that come upon us when we just go through it. What do we need? What did they need? They needed Jesus to speak. And that's what he does. You see, this is something that is absolutely key as he calls them to perseverance, as he calls them on to endurance, as he tells them, all right, be faithful unto death. He, he speaks to them and he, he challenges them to continue on in faithfulness. And here's the thing that's so amazing about what he says is he says, I, I know, and, and don't misread that. Don't look at Jesus saying, I know of your tribulation and of your poverty and of the slander and he's just saying alright I'm distant in heaven looking down on you and I see what's going on and, and, and I'm so sorry for you that's not what he's saying he does not say even though this would be true that I know about your tribulation or I know about your poverty or I know about the, the slander he says I know it do you know what that means he knows Tribulation. He knows poverty. He knows slander. It's the difference between these two words, empathy and sympathy. That Jesus is empathetic. In other words, he has experienced what you are going through. He has experienced pain and suffering and betrayal and hardship and denial. All of these things. He knows it. How, how much more helpful when you are going through something when somebody comes and walks alongside you and says, I've been there. I've, I've, I've been right where you were. As opposed to somebody standing outside and simply saying, oh, I'm so sorry for you. Jesus has been there. Not only has he been there, he's been victorious. Now, that pushes me on. In the sermon. Because what we also see is this call to perseverance, this, this intimate, detailed knowledge of the things that are going on in the midst of our struggles. Praise God that we have a God like that. Oh my goodness. We rejoice to have a God like that. A God that's intimate in our world and intimate in our struggles and intimate in our pain and knows what's happening in our lives. That's our God. But then he gives us this wondrous perspective on all that's happening, okay? And this perspective is driven, as we look at the text, by Jesus putting some things forward to us about himself and about what's happening in the church. 
Now, in, in each of these letters, and this is something I mentioned last, last week to you. In each of these letters, Jesus basically begins the letter by saying some things about himself that he typically is pulling out of chapter 1, ways that he has revealed himself. And then he, what he does is he'll bring these back to the specific church and he'll say something about himself that is pertinent to what's happening in that church. And he does that in verse 8. So he says, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Now he's making two statements here about him, about himself. One is that he is the first and the last. The other is that he was the one who died and came to life. Now, as the first and the last, I mean, other ways you could put that, he's the beginning and the end. Another way you could put that is, and you see this language in Revelation, he is the Alpha and the Omega. He's, he's declaring something about himself. He's declaring that he is, he is the eternal one, right? He's the first and the last. He's before all things and after all things. That he's the eternal one. That's a claim. In, in some ways, you could say that this right here is a claim to divinity. That he is saying in this way that he is God. He's the first and the last. But he's also claiming more. He's, it's the first and the last. He's, he's saying that he's over everything. The word that we typically use within our circles when we talk about that is we talk about his sovereignty. That he is sovereign over everything. That he is sovereign over all history. That there's not a part of history from beginning to end. That Jesus isn't sovereign over. And so he's declaring that to this, this suffering, struggling, in pain church. I am sovereign over history. Now here's, here's something that happens when we are going through the pain and the difficulty of life. It can feel, and you know this, it can feel purposeless, can it? It can feel meaningless, especially if it goes on and on and on. And you're like, what in the world? That's why people give up. That's why people stop. Like, what in the world? Why am I doing this? But Jesus is saying, and this is, this is the reason why Paul could say that he works all things together. It's because he's sovereign over it. If he's not sovereign over it, he can't work all things together for the good of those who love him. So here's Satan, and he's doing it, man. And he's opposing, he's hurting, he's harming. He's causing tribulation and strife and upheaval and all those things. He's throwing people into prison. And yet Jesus declares that he is over all of that. I mean, think about it. There's, there's no... There's no wickedness of the evil one that can do you ultimate harm because Jesus is victorious over him. There's no painful, difficult thing that can happen in this life. There's no persecution that can happen in this life that Jesus isn't bigger than that. I mean, some of us are probably keeping up with some of the things that are happening in parts of the world where Christians are being killed to this day. I mean, there are Christians all over the globe right now who are dying for Christ. And to the extent that we are able and would want to, we want there to be some impact in some way that we can bring change. But even if we can't, Satan doesn't win that. And the reason he can't is because even the thing that scares us most, even the enemy that we all, we, we just, we, we, we face it, it is an enemy, it does not win and that's death. And that's what he's talking about next. He died and he came to life. That's his resurrection, right? That's his crucifixion. That's the one who was, who was persecuted more than all of us. This is the one that was persecuted to the point of being put on a cross. And yet, Satan couldn't win, and death couldn't win, and sin couldn't win. But yes, he died, but he came to life. Don't, don't let 
even the potential death of this body cause you to back away from honoring Him. This isn't everything. That's what He's saying. There's more. Don't stop. Don't give up. Even to death. Because you will have life eternal. Now, he's saying, all right, you got to connect into me here. You got to connect into my rule and reign over all of this. You got to connect into my victory over death. You got to connect into those truths. You got to believe those things to endure and to persevere. But he also, he says something else. He also is saying that in the midst of the worst, the worst kind of difficulties, the worst tribulation, that he is actually at work in that. Now this takes you back to verse 9. Now remember what I, what, I, what I read. I just read the bad stuff at first. So he says, I know of your tribulation. I know of your poverty. I know of your slander. That's the bad stuff. That's the hard stuff that's happening. But then what, is, what else does he say? But you are rich. You're rich. So all of these things that are happening, they would see with their eyes all these physical things that are awful. All of the material loss. And yet, through that, he's saying, but, but you, are, you are rich. You know, I find it really interesting to, to note this. Because I, I think this is a challenge to us in terms of how we think about life and how we think about church and how we think about everything. Here's seven churches. Five of the seven get condemnation from Jesus and a call from Jesus to repent and turn around. Two of them only get encouragement and only get commendation, not condemnation, but commendation. And the two that only get encouragement and commendation are Smyrna and Philadelphia. And both of these churches are churches that are struggling. Both of these churches are churches that are suffering in some way. So here's a church in Smyrna suffering persecution. The church in Philadelphia is incredibly weak. And Jesus, he commends them without rebuke. And how different is that than the way we normally process things? I mean, how many of us look at I mean, I mean, let's just be honest for a minute. How many of us will look at the persecuted church and go, man, I want to be faithful like that? Or how many of us look at all the models of growth that are based on numbers and money and all those kind of signs of, that we think are signs and indicators of, of great health in the church? How many of us are running off to how to be a persecuted church conference? I didn't sign up for that one. How many of us run off to the How to Be a Mega Church conference? Now, I am not, and so don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that God can't bless us and bless us with things. I'm not saying that, okay? But what I am saying is this. If we think that those things, whether it's money, whether it's health, whether it's numbers, if we think that those things are indicators of health, those things alone are indicators of health. We may end up having a church that is incredibly spiritually impoverished. Because what happens in those times is nominalism, religious nominalism takes hold. What, what happens in those times is, is religiosity can take hold. And so you start asking yourself, why, why does the, uh, this Bible Belt Christianity look like Bible Belt Christianity? Where you have all kinds of people walking around saying they know Jesus, but if they were ever challenged in a way where they would lose something, they'll back away from it. That's nominalism. And it can take us if we're just having success. And Jesus says, no, no. And what he does, he goes on to say, though, is this. 
that what suffering and pain and persecution can do is they test us. They prove us. I mean, doesn't he say this in verse 10? Behold, this is right after talking about what the devil's going to do. Behold, the devil's about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days, you will have tribulation. Now, let me just mention something real quickly about the 10 days, because here's one of the things I, I know we would say. I, I say it myself. You know, if I only knew that I had to suffer for 10 days and then it would be over, I could probably do that. Right. <laughs> we need to understand what he's saying here. The 10 days is probably not literal. It's probably symbolic, like so many of the numbers that he uses in Revelation. It's probably a reference back to, in connection back to Daniel. I'll leave Ryan Dean to answer that one, though. Ten days most likely means a definite time and a short time. Okay? So he's saying, or a limited time, not necessarily a short time, but a limited time. So he's saying you're going to be thrown into prison for a definite period of time and a limited period of time. But here's the thing you have to keep in mind. At the end of that, Jesus is not promising them that they're just going to be free to walk, walk out and go on about their business. In the ancient world, typically, here's what happened in prison. You were in prison for trial. If you were found guilty, which they would have been because they would not have said Caesar is Lord. Then you notice what he goes on to say, be faithful unto death. You know why he says that? Because that was going to be the end of this time. So it may have been a definite time. It may have been a limited time. But the end of that definite time and that limited time for many of these Christians would have most likely been they would have been put to death. That's what he's talking about. But he describes this as a time in which they're being tested or, or proved that they belong to him. And that's what happens when we suffer. If we're, if we're going through difficulty and pain and we're continuing to press into Jesus, we're, we're, we're showing something. We're, we're proving something about who we are and what we are. And God blesses that, and he builds our faith, and he builds perseverance. It's why James would actually say to us, when, you, when you're going through trials, count it all joy. Why? Because it continues to build us. We, we stood the test. God is working in the midst of it. It's making us stronger. It's causing us to persevere more. It's building character. It's causing steadfastness more and more. So we keep trusting him, and he's always there. He's at work in us, making us stronger and stronger. That's what he calls us to. And so we get this perspective that, yes, it may be hard, but God is in it. He's doing something in our lives. He's over it. He's at work in all of it. And then the last thing that he does, and I'll be brief on this, is he makes a promise. They persevere because a promise is being made. And so if you look at the last part of verse 10 and verse 11, he says, I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. And so conquering is just simply holding to Jesus. It's, it doesn't mean you're going to be triumphalistic in this world. It doesn't necessarily mean that. It just means you're holding to Jesus. You're conquering. You're holding faithfully to Christ. Okay. He says, then no matter what happens, no matter if we lose everything, if we lose our lives, if we hold to Jesus, we will be victorious. He says, I will give you the crown of life. Just hold on to him. Now, this isn't, don't read into this. It's not saying you're meriting salvation or anything like that. That's not the point he's making. What he's doing is he's encouraging. He's not calling you to, to merit this. He's encouraging you. He's saying, you may lose this thing. You may lose this battle, but you're not going to lose the war. Just keep holding on to me. And the crown of life will be yours. That's the promise. That the second death, which is separation from God, eternal separation, the second death will not hurt you. Some, I don't know, 60 years from this point, depending on when you date Revelation, if you date it in the 90s, just a little over 60 years from this point, there's a bishop in this city, in this church, and you know his name. You've probably heard these stories before. His name was Polycarp. And Polycarp, this is, this is one of the ways that we know what was going on in that time, is that Polycarp, who had, had been, legend says, a disciple of, of the Apostle John. 
He was a bishop in this church. And Polycarp was told to, to recant faith in Christ and to worship Caesar and to say Caesar is Lord. And he would not do it. And he was brought for execution. And, and the Roman proconsul over and over again challenged him to recant. And he would not. And, and one of the things he said, and this is probably the quote you have most heard if you've heard stories about Polycarp, is he said, 80 and six years I have served him. Why would I now revile my, my Lord and King? But they, the proconsul kept going at him. And they had actually gathered the wood around to burn him. Okay? And he pushed them to, to turn away from Jesus. And then he said this, and this, this may be something you've never heard him say, if you've heard quotes about him. He said, you, and this speaks to what Jesus is saying here. You, Polycarp says, you threaten me with fire that burns for an hour. But you are ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. When Jesus talks about the second death, he's talking about that fire. The revelation describes as the lake of fire. And it's eternal separation from God. And so Polycarp, what does he do? He weighs it out, doesn't he? He weighs it out. Here is something that can burn for an hour. And here's something that burns for eternity. I'm not giving up on my Jesus. I'm not turning away from him because of this one hour fire. And he was burned to death. And how many saints of old and saints today are experiencing this and walking to their death, holding on to the one who is holding on to them, Jesus. Because they know that the crown of life is theirs. And the second death, no matter how painful the first may be for a nanosecond in eternity's time, the second, it will not hurt us. Now, as we leave and I wrap up, let me say this. When, when you, know, you talk about these hard and difficult things, I mean, I don't want you to leave here. I want you to be encouraged. I want you, I want you to be encouraged in your perseverance. I, I want you to you know, leave here and I want you to work for, and I hope we do. We work for good in our society. We work for change in the society. We work for things to honor the Lord. We want to be salt and light. But I'm telling you, even if... You run smack up to, against a brick wall over and over again, and the wall falls on you. My brothers and sisters in Christ, you still win. Hallelujah. Still went. Let's pray. Our Lord, we are just so privileged to be yours and thankful to be yours and thankful for the call, thankful for the perspective, thankful for the promise. Help us to grow in our faith, Lord. Help us to live for you. Help us to stand for you. Help us to be bold for you. Help us to hold to the gospel, Lord, more than anything else. And be glorified in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.